Hi, this is Val Hart, the real Dr. Doolittle, and today I'm talking with Dr. Arthur Young. He's a nationally known as a homeopathic veterinary practitioner, a lecturer, teacher, and an author. He has studied with such eminent veterinary homeopaths as Drs. Richard Pitcairn, Christina Chambro, and Don Hamilton. He comes to homeopathy with over five decades of experience as a clinician, a researcher in contagious diseases of primates, an instructor in the pathology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, and he is an innovator in the application of homeopathic medicines for exotic animals. His metamorphosis from allopathic or conventional methods and beliefs to homeopathy has been a gradual process and a very interesting one. A decade ago, his observations derived from many years of clinical and academic medicine changed his focus. And he says that in his opinion, many health problems in animals have been created by the practice of over-vaccination, persistent use of steroids and antibiotics, and the many grossly deficient commercial diets available. Welcome, Dr. Young. Well, thank you very, very much, Val. It's a pleasure to be here, and we can do a lot of sharing, and everybody can uh, learn a lot of wonderful things. Uh, it's like all you wanted to know, but you didn't know who to ask. <laughs> Good. That well, we've got thing. you on the line, and we're going to ask you, because I know you know you've been in practice for, you said, six decades. Sixty and years. I graduated from the, the fabulous University of Georgia in 1952. Oh, my God. You have seen a lot. You've been around oh, the block a lot of times. I have uh, seen I have seen veterinary medicine change 180 degrees. Wow! And it, and of course it's been very valuable to me to have lived this long yeah. to see all of these things that have happened. Yeah. And so you can sort out the the good from not so good. Yeah. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to be gives you that chance the opportunity to think out of the box. Yes. And that's important. It is important. Tell us why. Why do you think it's important? Well, I'll tell you why. I I learned uh, when I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania in the pathology department that the one thing that I ever do is put a name on a disease. You see, if you name a disease, whatever it might be, it it puts blinders on you because once you've got a name, you have to adhere to a certain recipe. Ah. And when you adhere to a certain recipe, it, it doesn't allow you to think other than the recipe or to think in a different way than the recipe was uh, first predicated. Okay. And I find that and this is very, very important. That, uh, I never name a disease. I treat the animal what I see. And the same thing goes in human homeopathy, too. You treat the whole animal because the body responds to illness as it tries to heal it responds as a unit, not compartmentalized. You know, I'm an animal. I'm, I'm a. I'm a hot. I'm a hot uh, specialist. Don't bother me about your prostate. You know mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, this this is an important thing to get to to know that the body doesn't respond in pieces. Mm-hmm. Every cell of the body is infected. Or, uh, I'm sorry, affected when you hit your thumb with a hammer. Yes. Everything feels it. Does yes. that, it, it, does, it may be a, a like a my, my, a micro re- reaction, but it's there, mm. and it's fascinating to know that, and to know that there's no one size fits all. Okay, we are all individuals. There hasn't been a person like you or me since the beginning of time, and there won't be one uh, even after the next big bang. We are unique. We all are unique in the way we respond. And that's what makes homeopathic medicine so fabulous and gives you the opportunity to really open up and look at all the aspects of illness. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. But, you know, you didn't start as an alternative homeopath. No, I did not. I will tell you. Can I get into that a little tiny bit here? Yes. Tell tell us how you met a more. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I practice traditional medicine for 38 years. Now, that's long enough for them to give you a watch and send you to Aruba for the rest of your life. <laughs> but that wasn't the case with me. I just loved what I was doing. And in uh, 1990, to be exact, that okay. that area, mm-hmm. I had an epiphany. Ooh. Everybody should know what an epiphany is. A, a, a big aha. Uh, an aha life-changing moment. 
Absolutely. My Pippin, I was sitting around. Um, I have, I've owned uh, some really nice hospitals that were all certified by the American Animal Hospital Association, uh-huh. and you know the good, the good, uh, the good allopathic stuff. Yeah. And I'm sitting around. I'm wondering how come these pets that we're seeing all the time are not staying out of this office? How come we're not curing them? I mean, really curing them yes. to the point where you know, they don't have to come back in a cup for a couple of years. But they're there every six months, so they're back in a couple of weeks or whatever. And they're coming back with either the same disease or what looks like the same disease, but with things added on. Yeah. Why is that happening? I mean, not just to me, but to all of my colleagues at the time. Right. I got to thinking about it, that the body, the body has a certain mechanism to protect itself. And the name, what's the name of that mechanism? It's called inflammation. Now, there are five cardinal signs of inflammation. There's redness, there's swelling, there's, there's heat, there's pain, there's loss of function. That's when the body says to you, hey, something is wrong over here, Charlie. Mm-hmm. Give me a hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's called inflammation. So what do we do? The animals or the people go in to see their allopathic practitioner, who, mm-hmm. who they're all right there to do a good job, mind you. They've all studied very hard, and they're very conscientious yeah. and very sincere. Yeah. But there's a little different slant on things here. So the, what happens is they give them, in order to give them some relief, what do they get? Anti-inflammatories known as steroids. Yeah. So what happens is that the symptoms are suppressed. The energy of that disease, the negative energy of the disease, instead of being eliminated, is just driven further into the body and covered up. The symptoms are gone. Everybody's happy. The dog or the cat or the giraffe, they're all happy. Mm-hmm. The owners are certainly happy. And, you know, and everybody thinks, well, gee, they've done a great job once again. But the suppression that has occurred is a disaster. Inflammation was meant to alert the practitioner, that the body has got a problem, and to sort out what that underlying problem is, underlying disease. I call it the sleeping giant. Mm, okay. In uh, homeopathic medicine, it's referred to as SORA, P-S-O-R-A, which was a, a word that was uh, coined by Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, okay. the great Samuel Hahnemann, who initiated formal homeopathic medicine back in 1800. It's a couple of hundred years old now, mind you. Mm -hmm. And so, not that the Romans and the Greeks didn't know something about it, I have to tell you. Okay. But nevertheless, so, that, once again, we know that there's underlying disease. And we've all got it. More or less, we've all got underlying problems. Yeah, we do. And it takes a certain, a a little upset to get you going. Uh, An emotional upset. You lose a loved one. Right. A, A virus, a bacteria. Uh, a traumatic thing like an automobile accident or you're playing football and you get a concussion. All those things that will wake up the sleeping giant and all of a sudden, what is this going on? It's a, it looks like a new disease, but it's been there forever. Yeah. And a lot of it's genetic, don't forget that. Yeah. So anyway, we have a situation where now we've, we've, we know that the body is, is being suppressed. So the next thing that happens is antibiotics. Antibiotics, if you break that word down, it's antibio, against life. The body has a wonderful ability to heal itself. We see it in cats all the time. When they get bitten, they develop an abscess, the abscess breaks open, it drains, and the cat's all better. Yeah. Without me coming in with an antibiotic. And also, I'll tell you one of the things, and this is very, very important, it's a thing called dysbiosis that's spelled D as in dog, Y-S, B as in boy, I-O-S-I-S, dysbiosis. And what is that? When these antibiotics that you're taking get into your intestines, they knock off the good bacteria, yeah. which are responsible for good digestion. And we have all of these animals that we see coming around who have been on antibiotics for years for one thing or another, and so, you know, it's an interesting thing that uh, the great uh, Albert Einstein, you know, the relativity theory, Einstein? Yes, yes we love him. He said the definition of insanity 
is when you do something, you give something to get a result, you don't get a result, and you keep on giving the same thing, basically hoping that it will change and it will be okay. Yes. That's like one antibiotic doesn't work, you give another one. That doesn't work, you give another one. That doesn't work, you give another one, you know? Yes. And the body, after a while, uh, becomes a... Just absolutely suppressed with all this stuff. There's no ability to really rise to the occasion. There is a thing. There is a thing, and it's called the the life force. That's what that's what naturopathic medicine people refer to. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we refer to it as the vital force, or the German word that uh, that Dr. Hahnemann gave it to, which is called the Vegan. Okay. But nevertheless, that's the innate energy, the innate energy that allows everything in this world to exist. If you can't come up with a, uh, a way of looking at things, a point of view uh, that, the, that energy is behind everything. Energy is there when the cells, the cells talk to one another. They don't do it in Czechoslovakian. They do it in energy. Mm -hmm. And as these cells talk to one another, this is known as cellular communication, what happens is that the organs are able to perform in sync. And when that cellular communication is interrupted by illness, the communication uh, that's there to cause the body to, to perform normally is lost. And so what do you do? You've got to, you have to take into consideration that with this energy that's always there, that you have to do something about that. Well, I'll tell you one of the things. I will tell you that one of the big things that I find in practice and have all these years is stress. Yeah. Stress is one of, this is one of the subjects I was going to, I mentioned. I'm getting, I'm getting it all on all points here, you see? Yeah. Once I get started, I, I can't be stopped. <laughs> so the point, <laughs> but boy, do we, do we have fun. Force, you're a force to be reckoned with. Keep going. Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, you take stress. When you're stressed out, you're, you're, you, you cannot heal the way you should. The body systems do not work the way they should. So stress becomes something that in all cases of illness, I don't care what it is, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how brilliant or rich or anything that you might be, I don't care if you're a lion or a tiger, mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a cockroach, mm -hmm. if you don't have the, if you, if you're faced with stress, then your body, whatever it is, can't respond to protect itself. But we, you take for instance in this country. In the U.S. of A., we have enough dysfunctional families to sink the Queen Mary. <laughs> and here, really, and here is this dog or cat mm -hmm. who is ill, who is being treated by a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Probably not a homeopath, probably a guy who treats the traditional stuff very very successfully uh, as years have gone by. Yeah. And uh, this animal is being treated, and he's not really, he or she, let's, let's be politically correct there, <laughs> he or she is not responding as they're supposed to. Right. But meanwhile, the, the breadwinner of the house is coming home on Saturdays and, uh, and doing a number on his wife with a club. Mm. Then there are the kids. They're in the back room and they're sniffing whatever they sniff. Mm -hmm. they're do and there's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of, a lot of anger in that house. Yeah. All of this negative energy. That, that, that animal is going to have a terrible time getting better. Or if he gets better, it'll be temporary. And then the, these stressful things that happen are the, they are the catalyst to wake up that sleeping giant. So you see, stress is so important. You take, you take, for instance, a jury up. Geriatrics has become very important in veterinary medicine. Very important. Why? Well, people have earned enough money to retire to Florida. Yeah. Well, I used to, where I practiced for almost 30 years. And, uh, what they do is when they leave, well, say, when they leave Podunk, wherever Podunk is, <laughs> they, they, they bring with them the, the, comes the wife, comes the husband, and comes the, the little dog that they've had for many years, maybe more than one dog, maybe cats, who knows. But they come down for the, that right that thing called retirement. Well, they 
get there, and then one of the spouses gets sick and passes away, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, what have we got left there in that you in that uh, that family that connects the surviving spouse to life as they know it and knew it? Well, it's the little dog, it's their animal, or it's the yeah. little cat. Yeah. It is up to the veterinarians to keep that little person, that little animal, healthy, so that the the person who is surviving the uh, the union, the marriage, doesn't go into a depression, doesn't go into a a sadness, and and when depression leads to sickness, we know that. Yeah. One of the great causes of cancer is is depression. Yeah. And and stress, I might add. Yeah. So the question is this it's up the veterinarian therefore assumes a very, very important role in society to keep these people who have lost their their uh, their bridge with the past, we'll say, yeah. and are now wandering around out there in a in a desert of, of loneliness. But now when the, when George, the little poodle, comes trot, trotting in the room and jumps up in your lap and laps your face, mm-hmm. all is well almost with the world. Yeah. That's why pets are so... Pets have become an incredible, important thing in our country that people spend $37 billion a year. Yeah. Count it. $37 billion a year on their pets. And, uh, and rightly so, because they are not other nations... No. They are not. They are. They are other. They are not. They are not uh, less than we are. No. They are. I, I'll have to repeat that. I'll have to change that a little bit. They are other nations, living with us on this same planet, putting up with the travail of Earth. They hear things that we never hear. Yeah. They they sense things that we have never sensed. They in other words, they are not inferior to us. They're in many respects, way ahead of us. The one thing that they lack, of course, is this verbal communication. Right. But uh, actually, it's it's so Im- it's so important that you can tell the health of a nation the way they take care of their pets. Yes. And that's something that a very very important thing to know. And in this country, let me tell you, they take care of their pets. Well, we do the best we can given what we know, but. As you were talking earlier, you know, you spent so much time in traditional medicine, but then you got to noticing that we actually weren't keeping them as healthy and well as as possible. And so things have not been going on a very happy rose rose path, or, you know, a happy yeah. path here. Well, I'll, I'll, so if I may, let me tell you that one of the main problems that the animals have been ill or not been able to really be at their top is the the amount of the kind of food that they've been exposed to. Okay. If, uh, if let me tell you something, if you knew what went into a lot of commercial dog foods and cat foods, you would be amazed. You would be absolutely uh, livid. Yeah. I'm not going to go into it on the uh, on this thing because it's you know it's yeah. uh, it's that bad. But there's uh, yeah. I will tell you this: in a lot of the animal food that you see, there is a thing called. Are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. Roadkill. <laughs> you think all those little rain, those little uh, deer on the on the side of the road, and the, mm-hmm. and, the, and the animals that are knocked off on the highways. Mm-hmm. What do you do? What do you think they do with them? They're they're picked up by whoever picks them up for the, and then they're they're put in, they're sent to a, a rendering plant. Right. And then at, at the rendering plant, they go into a a process. Hair. Rabies collars, or rabies tags, and collars, and all into whatever they use, and they are made into a uh, uh, a product which is then called meal, mm-hmm. and it's added to commercial food. So, that, and then with that fact, what goes in there is not only the animal, but all of his diseases, right, and all of his allergies, all of the things that 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 haunted him during his life. Yeah. And all of the drugs that he had, and all the vaccinations, who do you think's consuming them? Right. Now, now I'll tell you something. In commercial foods, for the most part, for the great most part, they are 
heat processed. Now, what does that mean? Well, when they you know they put them in the various big vats and they cook it and, da, 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 and everything, mm-hmm. everything that's everything that's worth anything is knocked off at 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. At that degree Fahrenheit, out go all of the good nutritious parts of the food, the vitamins and, the, and uh, all of the all of the things that give food the ability to create a healthy body. Yeah. So that's all gone. So now what do we do? We turn around and we add in to the stuff that's left after the heating, we add in artificial stuff. We add in things that, you know, that are produced, uh, you know, not in the body or not in the ground, but they're produced in a, you know, in a test tube or they're produced in a, in a, in a vat. It's all artificial. Okay. And it's not the natural stuff that goes back in to take care of the stuff that got knocked off. What do you think of that? I think that sucks. You know, I've okay. always wanted, <laughs> in my technical term, um, I've always wondered, you know, in order to can food, it has to be heated beyond a certain amount, and, you know, d- a degree. Sure, they got to um, they pasteurize yeah. it. So to speak. Right, they have to pasteurize it. And then they, even if they add stuff back to it, how do they get it in there if it's already in the can and being pasteurized and sealed? So well, no, they put it back into they put it back into the the mix that they have right, but before they like, stick it in the can. Yeah, but then they yeah. have to seal the can. Oh yeah, well of course so, they they seal it. They're sealing in nothing. Exactly, it's my point. So they may add it back in, but it they're still destroying it in the, in exactly. the whole process. That's exactly. It's not. It's, it's so. it is not the same. No, it that's is not. That's for sure. Yeah. So there's there, there is that. Uh, uh, now, here's something that's really going to knock your socks off. Okay. When they heat the food, whatever, it changes the molecular structure of the food so that the molecules now that are presented to the body in that food to digest and be assimilated, mm-hmm. they're no longer what you'd call friendly figures. They are strangers if you're living in Florida, it's strangers in paradise. If you're living someplace else, of course, that's something else. Okay. But they are strangers to the body's immune system. Oh. So what does the immune system do? It says, what, are you, what is this thing here? And so they marshal out, they bring out the trumpets and the whole thing, and out come the antibodies, row upon row. The antibodies come marching out to deal with the stranger. Huh. Because the molecular, the molecular structure of the food has been changed. Okay. And so when and when that happens, what do we get? Try skin allergies. Oh my goodness. Try a dig- chronic inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. Try all of the the zillions of things that can go wrong with the body when the immune system gets to going. Mhm. Right. So autoimmune problems. Immune uh, problems are rampant. Yeah. Rampant in this country, not only with the dogs and cats, but with the people. Right. So anyway, okay. So, so out come out come the, uh, the 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 troops, so to speak. Right, right. And in come the steroids. Well, of course, why you've got to use steroids when you have an allergy like that, and it's flared up, and the dog is sitting in the corner chewing himself up, yeah. chewing himself up, yeah. and itching and scratching, and the owner's getting nuts from it. Yes. And so what? Let's get let's get something done here. So the quickest thing to get done is a shot in the rear end of. Uh, uh, an antibody, a, a, a steroid. Okay. Okay. Then what happens is, then of course, many, many, many times, when the body is, uh, see, the body's not well at this point in time. The no. body, let's face it, something's wrong. Yes. So, as long as you're here in the office, folks, let's bring your dog up the snuff on its shots. Mm, yes. So we turn around and we give that name that you hear so often nowadays. Vaccine. Now, on the bottle of every vaccine that I've seen, it says to be used only in a healthy patient or or animal. Yes, that's true. This animal's immune system is challenged. He's not well. I don't know how you could think otherwise. We turn around and give him a vaccine, which in turn has an effect, a real effect on the immune system so it's like it's, a, it's like a, a round and around she goes and where she stops nobody knows oh, 
we have a feeling of where it stops, unfortunately. Yeah, well, animals, and I'm, I'm, of course, I've got my own feeling about vaccinations and kids, but that's, we'll leave that for another time. Okay. But the thing is, though, that in animals, we see more stuff go down, more unfortunate things happen because yeah. their immune systems are challenged, and at the same time, they're being vaccinated. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that the person who's vaccinating them means to do that. They don't. People don't become veterinarians because they, they don't like animals. They do it because they really love them. Yeah. They're doing the best they can they, with what they have been trained to do. Yes. I was trained to do the same thing. Yes. Fortunately, at least the way I look at it, fortunately for me, I was able to see, I was able to do a breakout and uh, change my way of life at 64 years old. I went back to school in Colorado at age 64 and studied homeopathic medicine. And the only reason that happened was because my partner at the time was a very, very good acupuncturist. Okay. And he looked, he was reading a magazine one day and he said, gee, Arthur, here's a, here's this course being given and, uh, it's alternative medicine. I know you want to do something with that. Mm -hmm. It's called homeopathy. And I didn't know homeopathy from a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I didn't. But I, I was craving. I was looking for something. I had I had gotten into uh, uh, you know treating animals with botanicals, and I, mm-hmm. I'd gotten into nutrition mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. like that. But it wasn't mm-hmm. homeopathy. It was holistic, we'll say. Yeah. Well, yeah. So anyway, okay. so then off I went to Fort Lauderdale, and I took a three day crash course in what homeopathy is all about. And after that, I was like a lady of the evening. I had changed. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. I couldn't get my hands on animals fast enough to treat them homeopathically. Wow. It was it was that kind of thing. It was just always it was but it was marvelous. It that was, was absolutely great. fantastic. So anyway, that's how I got into uh homeopathic medicine and I, I studied out in Colorado and I came back and I, I took my my boards and I passed. I became uh board certified at the age of sixty five. Wow. Can you imagine? I, and, yeah, uh, I love it. I've been I've been doing it ever since, and having a, a and I won't quit. I cannot quit. Why? There are so many people out there who are uh, are crying, crying for alternative medicine for their pets. Yes. They say I don't want drugs. I don't want drugs. Yeah. I don't want Prozac. I don't want my dog stoned on Prozac. Yeah. I don't I don't want them on uh, all kinds of. For instance, animals that have epilepsy, yeah. and they give they we and now listen. I've done. I can say this with impunity because I used to do it. Yeah, I was the I was the party that I did like everybody else did until I got to this point in my life. And thank goodness, and uh, you know it's, it's all right. I'm not making a lot of money, but I'm having fun. Well, <laughs> that's that's the important uh, part. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. So anyway, uh, then we get to vaccinations. Okay. May we talk about vaccinations for a little please, bit? Please, please let us know. What do you think about them? Why, why Not much. should we do them? Uh, well, frozen this is the deal. Boosters, all yes. that stuff. Tell us. I graduated from the University of Georgia. Okay. Go Bulldogs. Okay. I graduated in 1952. Okay. In 1952, uh, we were vaccinating animals once. We would vaccinate them, we'd give them a rabies shot, we'd give them a distemper shot, hepatitis shot, and usually that was about where it ended. They had their, their initial shots when they were puppies. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, for instance, they, was a, they would give them a, well, back in 1952, there was no such thing as a series of shots. It didn't uh-huh. exist. Okay. okay, oh, that's interesting. didn't exist. And everybody was feeding their animal from the table. Okay. There wasn't any, you know, Formula One or this, that, and the other, and you get into it and all, all kinds of stuff. There was, listen, we're going to, you're, you're a dog, you can have the scraps, you can eat the meat, you can have the vegetables mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and all that good stuff, and uh, that's what you're going to get, Charlie. Mm-hmm. And they survived, and they did well. I can tell you, I am living proof because I've been there and I've done it. And I've seen these dogs that really ever had the problems that they have today. Wow. I would tell you that back in the back in the fifties and the early sixties, 
the animals didn't have one-tenth of the problems that you see today. And what was the difference? Well, the difference was in the food. The food is different today, yeah. the vaccinations. But mind you, if everything is coming into my office and everybody else's office, and these animals have what they call immune-mediated disease. Where did that come from? Because back in 1960, we didn't even see it. And so there, what happened was, and this is a really interesting thing. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to share this with you. Please. Back in 1960, there were some animals, dogs, who were being got their vaccinations, and they broke with distemper. In other words, the vaccine didn't hold. Okay. There was, there was a bunch of them. Okay. There can be a reason for that. Number one is that there are individuals who can't can't get up a, a uh, an immunity. They can't build the antibodies. They just and so what happens is the disease comes in and wipes them out. Okay. And there was a little there was a little area in that time that. Uh, Resulted in the, the, the vaccine company saying, well, listen, if they did, if they broke with the vaccine, we have to give them booster shots. And that started the avalanche of booster shots. So they went from, uh, a booster shot every year for distemper and a booster shot every year maybe for, for rabies. Uh -huh. But before you got through with it, before you got through, you had distemper, hepatitis, you had parvo, you had leptospirosis, you had corona, you had rabies, you had bordetella, that's kennel cough. Uh -huh, uh -huh. By the time you get through, you've got seven or eight viral situations that you're injecting into the, into the body. Not that leptospirosis is a virus, but it's another living thing. Yeah. And all of these living things have a life of their own once they get in. And once they get into the body... The immune system takes a look at these things. Not all, not all animals have reactions, of course. Nothing in the world is all, is, is, every, is always, yeah. or always the same. Always but there's the same. enough, enough of it around yeah. that these animals respond. And what do they respond with? They get, they have allergic response. They within the, within the first two weeks of having a, a, a vaccine, you can see all kinds of things happen. You can see animals who start to have diarrhea that never had it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Animals who start to throw up. Mm -hmm. uh, animals who, who develop skin rashes. Animals whose ears, oh, tell me about ears. Yeah. They're the hardest thing in the world to, uh, to cure. Yeah. They're very difficult. Yeah. I've spoken with uh, human homeopaths who are very, very well known in the world today. Mm -hmm. And they'll say they'll get a patient, a human patient, who's got all kinds of things wrong with them. They'll get everything straightened out except the ears, mm. and they're stuck with it. Wow. And I told them, I said, listen, I've got a, a cocker spaniel here whose ears would drive you out of the house mm. with the odor. Mm. I said, I can't settle for what you're telling me, mm. that you've got to forget about the ears. No. So we don't. And we were able to also, I would say, produce a fair amount of good results. But, but what happens is those ears are inflammatory. The dog is shaking his head. He's rubbing his side of his head on the on the floor he's whacking his ears with his feet yeah. and he, you know he cries a little bit the poor fellow it hurts, yeah well you know and and so uh you you go ahead and, and what goes into his ears nowadays i'll tell you what goes into his ears nowadays combinations of antibiotics and uh, steroids and where do you think the steroids end up they end up in the system yeah because they are absorbed into the system so you then you've got so now we're having all of these animals running around with a disease which I, I don't identify it by name because I don't treat it as such, but it's called Cushing's disease. Cushing's. Cushing's. Cushing's has got has got to do with the with uh, hyperadrenocorticism. Too much cortisone in the system. And okay. then you'll see that. That's one of the uh one of the spin offs that you'll get into. Huh. That's one of them. I call them I call them designer diseases. Wow. What are the designer diseases that you see as a result of uh, overstimulation of the or negative reaction by the immune system? Well, you see uh, what we just, what we were just uh, talking about. We were just talking about uh, Cushing's. Yes. Then let's talk about diabetes while we're at it. 
diabetes is rampant in this country in cats. Yes. Yeah, and yes. it's tough to treat, too, because cats are funny folks. Yeah, yeah, they I are. I mean, they don't react to all the insulins. The way they, they, we've got to go from one insulin to another insulin to another insulin yeah. to, to keep them. Uh, and they've got to go to the hospital. They've got to be, and they have to be balanced out. And they're in the hospital. It's big money. Yeah. Then, then of course, besides, then we have, besides, uh, then we have, uh, we have in cats, hyperthyroidism. Oh, my gosh. Hyperthyroidism is in, in, the, in cats is all over the place. It's a cat that loses weight. He's, as, he's like a nervous Nelly. Mm-hmm. He's all over the place. He's like yowling, howling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He, he's, uh, he vomits a lot. Mm-hmm. He's just one unhealthy looking guy. Yeah. Hyperthyroidism. And it, it, and it gets treated, of course. And, uh, they, he's on, he's on drugs for, the, for an awful long time. Yeah. So hyperthyroid is all over the place. Uh, hypothyroidism, which is the high thyroid gland not working as well as it is, is also around too. That's the fat, the dog with a pot belly and he's kind of fat and sluggish and he doesn't care if the Yankees win or not, you know, that kind of <laughs> animal. So, uh, that's the hypothyroid, uh, guy you'll see around. Yeah. But yeah. that, so, so we have, and then, oh, tell me about inflammatory bowel disease. Oh boy. IBD. Yeah. You know something? That is a uh, that is one of the the most common things you see around inflammatory bowel disease. And once again, they get treated with uh, antibiotics. Yeah. Let's give them antibiotics. Yeah. Let's knock off more of the good bacteria they might right. have left. Right. However, and and one of the things, however, people can do 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 is to use probiotics. Right. What do you those mean? are the good those are the good guy bacteria. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, and even and even for that matter, prebiotics, which are those foods which have the ability to uh, su- supply to the GI tract those n- those things necessary to keep it at least healthy. Prebiotics. Okay. So then you follow that with the probiotics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a it's a whole thing, but with a thing that that that's upsetting to me is that the cost of all of this stuff to the, the, the pet-owning public, and let's face it, we're in the middle of a recession, yeah. even though you know certain people don't recognize it, <laughs> but I recognize it, yeah. they, 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 and the people don't have the money mm-hmm. to yeah. treat their animals. Yeah. And as a result, they're, they're in a constant state of, uh, of, of upset, and all of the animals don't get treated. They get yeah. turned over to the Humane Society. Right. If they're lucky enough to find a home, they find a home. Yeah. And if they're not, a, if they're not lucky enough, they get put to sleep. That's right. So you know, we owe we owe a lot of uh, uh, we owe a lot of uh, of uh, what would you call uh, we 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 owe a lot of of wanting to keep these animals with us. They are our friends. The one thing about a dog or a, you know a dog is that he doesn't care who you are. You could be the worst jerk in the world. You could be do all sorts of bad things. He still thinks that you're you're the you know you're the good lord. That's yeah. the the way they are. They're yeah. just you know all that stuff. Yeah. That's another thing too that we run into is that people don't give animals the credit that they deserve. They know you're going on vacation before you bought your ticket. <laughs> the way it is. Yes, that's true. They said, you talk about the suitcase, it's all over. <laughs> so, you know, they're quite amazing. Oh, there's one thing I, okay, let's talk a little bit. Are we doing okay? We're doing great. I'm enjoying the, enjoying uh, okay. you very much. Okay, good. It's all, all very important. Okay. Now let's talk about the fact, ah, food. Yes. One of the things you see, now my wife jumped on my desk the other day, this thing from this particular uh, uh, publication, uh-huh. And it said, uh, dogs should not eat raw food diets. I'm going to quote now, because okay. I wouldn't write stuff like this. <laughs> These diets are, 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 are trendy now, but many raw food diets consisting of raw meats and vegetables were found to contain nutritional deficiencies that could lead to long-term health problems. <laughs> also, raw foods are more likely to contain bacteria that lead to Foodborne illnesses in pets and humans. They're talking about salmonellosis, by the way. Uh-huh. 
And I tell you, I've never seen a case of salmonella in an animal that uh, was on raw diet. And I was sharing this with a couple of my colleagues. I called up a couple of guys that I've got tremendous respect for today. Yeah. I said, guys, guess what I wrote? What, guess what my wife dumped on my desk just uh-huh. the other day? Uh-huh. And I read that to them. Uh-huh. And they they absolutely, you know, they had to pick themselves up off the floor. They were so, you know, incensed. And it says, what? Best for it. Now, in this this article, it says, best for dog health, uh, colon, a well-balanced, high-quality commercial dog food. Mm. Give me a break. First of all, when I tell people to, that they've got to feed, that they should be feeding their animals raw food, as I pointed out to you when we were talking before, I have never yet, I have never yet seen a dog sitting around a campfire cooking a hot dog. That's because their DNA says that they're a carnivore. Carnivore means a meat eater. And I will tell you who the quintessential carnivore is. The quintessential carnivore is the pussy cat. Yes. If a cat had nothing but meat to eat the rest of his life, he'd be thrilled to death. But you have to understand that in the, that in the native state, and they're out there, you know, the hunters and gatherers, you know. Yeah. In the native state, and when they kill something, they eat everything from the nostrils to the tail tip. Mm-hmm. Everything. Mm-hmm. That's the mm-hmm. spleen. It's the pancreas. It's the, it's the everything. Yeah. You can, you know what I mean. They yeah. even, they even eat the intestinal content. Yes. They eat everything, but in what they eat, is the, all of the stuff that is 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 in nature. And you, for instance, like in cats, in cats, commonly see that you commonly see are what hairballs. Yes. Why do you think you see hairballs? Because the gut is not doing the job it should, as far as it's, you know, it's milking things out. The peristalsis, they call it. I don't know how many people remember the word peristalsis, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's the gut uh, going through its, its work, moving things from front to back. Well, when, they, when that happens, when, when they can't move things uh, along as, like they should, they got hair while they're grooming themselves. Yeah. Did you know that in the wild, lions, tigers, cheetahs, they don't have hairballs? That's a good... How do you like that one? That's Isn't that good. beautiful? I love it. <laughs> so anyway... Well, they're not eating Purina 1 or... Well, there you go. They're not, they're not eating... Okay, so here we go. We have cats who are on a dry diet. You know, I'm not going to mention the names because there's too many of them. Yeah. Cats get, now listen to this, get your pencils out, folks. <laughs> Cats get 70% of their liquid from their food. Dry food has 10% liquid, moisture, I'll call it, moisture. Yeah, yeah. So from 70% moisture, they go down to 10% moisture, and what do they end up? They end up technically dehydrated. Yes. So all of these animals are out there, and then cats... Okay, cats have a lot of problems with their urinary system. If you've owned a cat, you know. Yes. They have yeah. they have bladder problems. Yeah. They have kidney problems. And so here you are with an animal whose whose system of the body, which is like a you know a, just to flush everything out to get rid of waste, yeah. that can't function the way it should be because the animal is partially dehydrated. That makes total sense. Absolutely. You think about that. So, now, if you want to, if you want to feed a, an animal a raw diet, like a cat, yeah. you can you can feed them on, uh, you know, like uh, a raw chicken or a raw beef, uh, so that they get that, and uh, they'll eat they'll eat a few vegetables, you know. And mm-hmm. cats don't need a, not, a lot of carbohydrates. What I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you that there's a book out there by a woman by the name of Anitra Frazier. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. It's Anitra called the, Frazier. An, Anitra Frazier, uh, F-R-A-Z-I-R. She wrote a book a long time ago, and it's still good, okay. called The New Natural Cat. And it's a complete guide for finicky owners. <laughs> That's but wonderful. For finicky owners. But anyway, you can, this, <laughs> this, this book, I'm going to put, well, if anybody wants to find out how to get this book, uh, just send me uh, your name or something on the on my internet. 
okay. uh, my do- my uh, my uh, you know email. <laughs> my yeah. email uh-huh. is is this way. Okay. Doc Appleseed. You see, I'm a cousin of Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> Everybody knows Johnny Appleseed. Are you he, really a he, cousin? He, he planted apple trees, yeah. and I plant ideas. That's Thank where you. I got that. Name. <laughs> okay, I love it. Doc okay. Appleseed at Comcast dot net. Okay. 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 One whole word, Doc Appleseed. Okay. Now, that's so you can find out about that. Uh, you send you send me your 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 uh, contacts, and I'll see that you get this. Okay. Now the other thing is, there's a book out. For that now in 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 uh, Anitra's book, all the diets you could ever want, the natural diets, all the good stuff that you should know about your pussy cat, and it it'll save you a uh, millions of bucks. Wow. Because you won't be at the vets all the time. Wow. There's another okay. another book written by Doctor Richard Pitcairn, like in Pitcairn's Island. Uh-huh. Richard Pitkin, P-I-T-C-A-I-R-N, Richard Pitkin. And it's, his book is called, uh, a, it's called The Complete Guide to Natural Health, Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. Okay? Uh-huh. And you, I'll let you know how you can get a hold of it. Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. It's got all the diets in there for dogs. It's got more stuff in there. It's got all kinds of alternative medicine things. And what's it that all the people should know? Because, you know, you say, to, you say, okay, I want you to feed them a raw diet, and it's got to be balanced. Yeah. How do they balance it? Yeah, we don't know. Every, every animal is different, like every person is different. You don't give them the same thing every day necessarily, so. Right, right, right. So the, you have to know how to, one of, I'll tell you something. For instance, uh, one of the things when, when, you, when people start to feed, you know, diets at home themselves, uh-huh. They end up with uh, deficiencies, particularly in dogs, in calcium. Dogs need a lot of calcium. Okay. They they get a deficiency in essential fatty acids, and they get a deficiency in fat. Now these things can cause all kinds of problems. So you've got to know how much of this stuff to to add in. Yeah. And that's why you have to have something that you can refer to, a book, a guide, rather than you know, somebody saying, well. You know, you do this, you do that. Yeah, it's got to be a little that. bit, it's got to be more scientific in a sense than that. Okay. okay? Okay. For instance, one of the things, here's something, mm-hmm. you you should feed animals bones. Yeah, okay. Okay. What kind of bones? Raw bones. Raw bones do not shatter. Yeah. Raw bones do not stick in your gut. Raw bones contain a lot of calcium which dogs need. Right. Okay. So, then we get to the pussy cats. Well, I tell everybody, and also our dog owners, give your animals uh, chicken necks, the bones of chicken necks. Okay. With meat on them, meaty bones. Right, meaty bones. And Yeah, meaty bones. And what will that do for the pussy cat? It will keep his teeth cleaned. Okay. That will uh, keep knocking the, the tartar off from their teeth. And one of the big problems in pussy cats is dental disease. Yeah. Disease in the mouth, oral disease, which in turn, when you have an infection in your mouth, where do you think the bacteria go when you're chewing everything? Yeah. They get into the bloodstream and they end up on your heart valves. Oh, boy. Yeah. And you end up with a cat with uh, uh, maybe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay. which is a, an enlarged heart that doesn't doesn't do too well. So there's a there's a, a good example for for dental health. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you something else. One of the things that people forget to do is to bring their animals in once a year. I'm not talking about every six months necessarily. So I'm talking about once a year, particularly when they reach the age of seven. Seven's the cutoff. At seven, we become geriatric. Okay. If you're a dog or a pussycat. And things start to happen. They might have happened a little bit before, but that's a pretty good thumb rule. Okay. Okay? So you come in at age seven. Well, what does that mean? Well, the first two years of a dog's life is equal to 24 human lives, 24 human years. Yeah. Uh, every year after that is equal to four. So, in other words, if a dog is seven years old, He's uh, 24, and 5 times 4 is 20. 
He's uh, he's 44 years old. Okay. And a lot of folks at 44 years old, it's got to, you know, they have some problems set in. Yeah. But anyway, and you take, for instance, uh, the dog that, ah, uh, that I can tell you a story. Many years ago, there was a guy by the name of uh, Lauren Green. Mm-hmm. Lauren Green was on that uh, program that, that with the Cowboys. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah, the, uh, Bonanza? Yeah, yeah. Bonanza. He was on Bonanza, and he was, yeah, and he was sponsored by one of the Super Duper dog food companies, and they say they were proudly to say that they had this dog here. They had the dog right there. That the dog was 15 years old, which made him 105 years old. This dog's 105 years old, and look, he's eating this stuff, and look how well he's doing. Uh-huh. Well, I wrote them a letter. I said, folks, that dog is not 105. Yeah. The first two years are equal to 24. Uh-huh. We're now left with 13. 13 times 4. Mm-hmm. is 42, right? Mm-hmm. Good. This dog is 66 years old. Okay. They know what they told me to do? They told me to mind my own business. Uh-huh. They, told, they sent me a letter. <laughs> my, and, and, they, yeah, and, and, yeah, to paraphrase it, mind your own business and keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, really, isn't that, isn't that horrible? <laughs> Terrible. But anyway, okay, now I want I want to talk a little bit. How are we doing on time? Pretty good? Uh, we're all right. Keep going. Okay, okay. i got something I want to share with you. Okay. It's called the boarding nightmare. Okay. What yeah. is the boarding nightmare? Well, I'll tell you what it is. First of all, putting the cat or dog into the car and driving to the boarding place, whether it's an animal hospital or a regular boarding kennel. Okay. If they've been there before and they hadn't had a wonderful a wonderful experience, which could happen without without anybody doing anything to them. Well, I call it the road to perdition, because they're already shaking. <laughs> they're already feeling the threat of being taken away from the family and put into a stainless steel cage, two feet by two feet. That's if you're a cat, and then or a bigger cage if you're a dog. Yeah. And that, and you're used to the fact that at night time, night time comes. Yeah. At seven o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever it is, the 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 place the the, the place closes down. Yes. Everybody goes home to watch American Idol, <laughs> so, which I do religiously. <laughs> but, but, but meanwhile, the the dog or the cat is left there, and at three o'clock in the morning, they get the urge to go. Yeah. And they're sitting there and they're barred in like they're in a you know. In, in uh, isolation or solitary confinement, mm-hmm. they have to do what? They have to eliminate in the cage. Oh. Now, cats are a little bit luckier than dogs because they usually have a litter box, and so the litter, you know, soaks up the urine, and yeah. they have smaller and they have smaller poopies than yeah. dogs do. Yeah. But meanwhile, there's a dog sitting there, and they say, "I've got to go to the bathroom." My owner said, "I can't go. I'm housebroken." Uh-huh. And now you're a bad boy. Why did you do that? Bad, 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 bad. Boo! And mm-hmm. he, and all through my life, that made me feel that during my well, when they were housebreaking him, that yeah. this was not the thing to do. Yeah, I'm not supposed to go. And I'm going to do it. I have to do it. I don't have a choice. Yeah, I can't cross my legs enough. I have to do it. So they do it. And yeah. why do you think? So they do it. Number one, this 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 stuck. With a dirty cage. Yes. Number two, the guilt that goes on. And what comes after guilt comes resentment and anger. And why did you do this to me? Mm-hmm. And all of the stuff that goes along with There are many, many animals yeah. that don't like to be left alone. Oh, yeah. There are many, many animals who have what they call, I guess for lack of a better word, um, anxiety uh, that, go, that comes with... Uh, uh, something uh, anxiety, separation. anxiety, and uh, yeah, separation anxiety. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah. You know all the things. Yeah. But separation anxiety. Yeah. And uh, and they re- and it's a problem for them. And what happens? They'll start with uh, having a nervous stomach. They'll start with diarrhea, or they won't eat. Yeah. All of these things that go on with separation anxiety. Yeah. And separation anxiety is enough enough of a trigger to wake up. What I told you initially, the sleeping giants. Oh. So they, they're sitting there in this cage, okay. Okay. and they get out there. So finally at 7 o'clock in the morning, the kennel girl shows up. Thank God. 
and they let them out, and they go to the bathroom, and everybody's happy all day long. They're in, they're out, the bump, the bump, the bump. Uh-huh. But then what happens? Eight o'clock comes again. Yeah. The owner's away for two weeks. Yeah. So from uh, from eight o'clock at night until seven o'clock the next morning, it, that's a long time. Yeah. That's twelve hours. Yeah. They 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 have to hold up. They have to hold in everything. And I have to tell you something. I worked in, an, I've had enough animal hospitals and seen enough cages and enough animals to know that yeah. they could produce a lot of stuff in that length of time. Yes. Yeah. So meanwhile, they're in in the care of people they don't know, unless the owner brought along the food, which some people do, by the oh, way. Right. They'll cook up the food and they'll bring enough in the pots and everything. They'll say, "Well, this is what he eats," and uh, and that's okay. And that'll be fine. But meanwhile, they're subject to food they've never even seen before. Right. And they don't eat it. Yeah. And so when they don't eat it, no one will have the first thing that I've ever noticed in all the years that I own hospitals. When I boarded, the first thing that would go would happen, you'd start to see them vomit bile, this yellowish saliva yeah. that they threw up in their stomach. That would be yeah. the clue that things are going to go to hell. Yeah. Excuse my friends, I'm off. Sorry. That's okay. So you uh, okay? So anyway, okay. that 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 would be the first. That would be the clue that they would start to throw up yellow bile. Because they weren't eating right anyway, and their stomachs were empty. Yeah. So the point is that once that this thing starts, it it, it, it it builds and it builds and it builds. And two weeks after they've been home, they start with the GI upset, uh-huh. the vomiting and the diarrhea and all that stuff. And then they end up uh, having to go to an animal hospital. Yeah. Which of course they probably have to, but the, you know, what I'm well. trying to say is. So then, then they got to go on drugs, mm-hmm. yeah. and the first thing that we get will be, uh, you can believe it, will be an antibiotic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which if all, if you've already got a gut that's upset, that's having trouble, and then you add an antibiotic. Yeah. To uh, to get rid of whatever good bacteria are still there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Of course no. it doesn't. No. Then there you have it. That, good. Then. Then we have the, the 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 dog or the cat or whatever goes into a, uh, a hospital. Probably, let's say we're geriatric. Let's say we're ten years old. Okay. And they go into the hospital. Say they go in for surgery, and they're there for a few days or whatever. And then they go home without any without any really emphasis on what are you going to feed them. Hmm. Nutrition becomes so important when you're post-surgical. You know, words, you've got to be getting the right, the right kind of nutrients, uh, the, the right number of calories, even if it's a guess. Yeah. You've got to have the, that in order for the healing process to continue in a very satisfactory way. Yeah. And yeah. that, my experience, my experience has been that that is something that is really not addressed. The geriatric patient that goes home post-surgically or even uh, uh, post-internal uh, medicine yeah. without having a, a lecture from somebody who knows how to care for that person, that dog, that kitty cat, in, in, a, in a post-illness type of situation. That makes a lot of sense. You know, it all makes a lot of sense. Yeah. To get, and, and I will tell you something, let me get back to the vaccination thing, if can before okay. I forget it. you bet. In the vaccinations, I'm all for vaccinating animals when they're babies. Okay. Okay? Okay. There's, there, are those, those are, there are eclectic people who don't, and they'll wait till the disease happens, and then they'll treat the animal, and the animal will get better and produce its own natural immunity. You get that? Yeah. Natural immunity. Yes. But without, uh, without vaccinations. So that, but that, not everybody's that brave. So you, you vaccinate them when they're puppies, or you vaccinate them when they're kittens, and they they probably have a series of vaccines that uh, should be over by the time they're maybe 20 weeks old. Yeah. Well, then, in, up until just very recently, it was every single year. Yeah. The same shots every single year. Now I don't know about you. Val, but if I walked into my doctor's office and he said, well, Arthur, here you are again, 
And we're going to give you those seven or six or eight uh, vaccines. Mm-hmm. Those, those, most of them are uh, uh, modified live viruses. Yeah. We're going to give them. I said, what, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. I'd throw the guy through the window. <laughs> they were not going to do that to my body. You're right. Then I say, why are you doing it to Fido? Yeah. Why are you giving him all those vaccines year after year after year? Uh, you're stimulating and you're, you're causing problems uh, inadvertently. Inadvertently. People don't do it on purpose. No. Uh, to, to, the, to the immune system. Yeah. Why are we seeing all of these animals who are, who are chewing their feet? One of the things you see so often are these interdigital cysts mm. in between the toes mm. of dogs. You'll see boils. You'll see swellings. They're kind of shiny. And they're all a re- most of them are a result of allergy. But what happens is they get operated on. They get opened up and to drain them. And that in itself uh, can lead to some problems, yeah. like infection. Yeah. But either way, but what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, this business of vaccinating every year, every year, you get to the point that the animals, uh, uh, their immune systems are so messed up they can't even they can't even raise up a fight against anything. Yeah. And they right. become incurable. Right. Meanwhile, not to say what's been going on in the rest of I have a question about vaccines. Why do you think we're over-vaccinating? I mean, you you said that originally a long time ago, we didn't do annual boosters and we didn't do series all over again every year and we didn't do any of that. What do you, why do you think we're doing it now, especially with it causing all these problems? Well, I don't want to be uh, overly critical, but I think that, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, economics. Okay. And I know for a fact, without fear of being contradicted, that up to a few years ago, 33%, between 30 and 33% of the revenue uh, brought into animal care facilities was generated by vaccinations. Wow. Okay. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's just giving shots. Pardon? That doesn't count all the treatment of all the things that come from the problems that over vaccine yeah. causes. So let me tell you this. There are certain people, clients, who are hung up on giving yearly boosters. Yeah. That's the way they're brainwashed. Well, they've been taught that. Well, I say to them, I say to them, okay, take your dog to the doctor and have blood titers done. That is, find out how many antibodies against these various diseases are floating around in the bloodstream. Okay. We're talking about, basically, we're talking about parvo, we're talking about distemper, those two. Okay. I said, at least check that out and and, and see if your animal has enough antibodies. Okay. That's what they call a, a, do it. Do it every year if you want to. Spend the money if you want to. Okay. Nine times out of ten, more than that probably, 999% out of 1,000, mm-hmm. they'll find that they do have enough antibodies. Okay. And they don't have to put them through the shots. Yeah. That, that's what they can do. That way, uh, that's okay. way if, if, they, if they have a feeling that, this is the, that they really need the shots, look, don't put, don't. Don't aggravate things in your dog's body because you don't know what's going on in there anyway all the time. That's yeah, true. Don't start things. Yeah. Do it tighter. Find out. Yeah. If the tighter isn't uh, up where it's supposed to be, go give a booster if it makes you feel better. Okay. So the other thing, right, Go ahead. The other thing I wanted to talk about was rabies. Okay. Now, rabies is an interesting vaccine. It causes a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. And a lot of uh, emotional problems. Dogs who, uh, at one point in time, were kind of mellow, mm-hmm. will become uh, aggressive. Okay. They don't have rabies. They have the symptoms of rabies. Don't you wow. understand? It's, oh. not, it's not that the rabies vaccine gives them rabies. It no. doesn't. Okay. But it mimics the disease in its symptoms. Wow. I did never Isn't know that. Isn't that something? Okay. Yes. Yep. Wow. So uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying about the, the, the idea of, uh, uh, oh, they did a study at uh, 
one of the prestigious universities not too long ago, maybe 15 years ago, mm -hmm. where they found that the rabies vaccination was good for at least nine years. Okay. Those of us who practice alternative medicine say if time of the animal. So you get one shot and then you're done. Through. Okay. Never again. Okay. okay? And okay. we see unusual, unusual things. I, I had one, this may be a delicate subject, but I'm going to share it. You can always cut it out if you'd like to. <laughs> but, uh, and this dog was owned by a, a world renowned, uh, female vocalist. Okay. Who lived in the town where I practice. Okay. Everybody would recognize her voice, her, her name. Okay. And she had this little poodle whose name was Charlie. Charlie, Charlie was, he was a, what's the word I'm looking for? He was always uh, interested in, uh, well, I'll use the word masturbation. That's what Charlie oh. did. <laughs> And, he was a uh, humper. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, yes, he was the, uh, the prodigal humper. <laughs> and it was driving uh, this woman crazy because it was embarrassing. Okay. So Charlie was brought in to me at the beginning of my homeopathic career. And I recognized the fact that Charlie was having a, uh, a case of vaccinosis. Oh, vaccinosis. Okay. okay. Uh, caused by rabies. So I treated him with a uh, with a remedy that's related to rabies. It's a it's a it's a, a, a what they call a no sod. It's not it's not it's made from the rabid material of dogs, but it's not rabies. Right. It's, it's okay. a you know it just been, it's manufactured in such a way as uh, that it can stimulate some some uh, protection and at the same time doesn't cause the disease. Well, don't you know? Okay. He got better. Mm -hmm. We treated him with, with rabies no soap called Lysin. Okay. And uh, it just didn't take long, you know, a couple of months, and he was all better. Oh, wow. Now, he didn't get better because I gave him steroids. He didn't get better because I gave him Prozac. Well, yeah. He didn't get better because I gave him antibiotics. Yeah. And he didn't get better because I changed his diet. But he did it. He got better because he got uh, this thing called a no soap. Well, but and it the, worked. Yeah, the symptoms that were causing the um, the behavior were gone. Yes. So he didn't need to do it anymore. Makes sense. So no, are, he was are, done. No, he was done. He 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 probably had uh, he had adequate protection against rabies for sure. Yeah. But yeah. that he had this reaction to the rabies vaccine. Okay. And it pre it's a modified live virus. And it produces the symptoms of the illness, but without having the illness. Right. That's how vaccines work, right? Well, that's, no, not necessarily so. I'm talking about one specific instance. Oh, oh. Vaccines, as a rule, stimulate the body to produce antibodies to protect against the disease. Okay? And they, and they do. They do protect against the disease. And in, in, in many cases, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But there's enough of... Uh, Reaction yeah. to the ra I will tell you, for instance, uh, animals who who will just all of a sudden in the middle of the night start yelling, mm -hmm. screaming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? They got a headache. Yeah. Now, however, that's not just a, a vaccination thing. Believe it or not, you'll see that in cats who have high blood pressure. Oh. Isn't that interesting? You ever think of a cat having high blood pressure? Uh, no. I haven't thought about that recently. Interesting. But yet it, it is, and uh, I have a, a cat right now that I am treating for, for high blood pressure. Okay. Quite elderly. Uh -huh. and But he's feeling a heck of a lot better. Okay. There are medications for that. Okay. Anyway, so we go on and on and on, and I will tell you one other thing. Let me just explain something to you. What is homeopathy? Okay. Now, most yeah. people don't know it. I, I didn't know what it was when I started studying it. Right. Homeopathy is a method of treating which goes back several hundreds of years where this brilliant, brilliant doctor, Dr. Samuel Hammond, I think he was our first space alien. That's how <laughs> bright he was. And okay. uh, what happened was that he recognized the fact that if you took uh, a substance, say like 
sulfur or silver or lead or whatever, and you uh, you made it into and you gave it to the uh, to a patient, a healthy patient, not a sick patient, a healthy person, and you gave it to him like maybe you took some of the material and you dissolved it into a into an elixir or a tincture, mm-hmm. and you gave it to him and they swallowed it, took it as in a pill form. Uh-huh. It would cause all kinds of symptoms. Right. You know, very bad symptoms. Right. However, if you took the same material and you started to dilute it, micro dilutions they called it, where you would take one cc of that elixir or one cc of that tincture and put it in 99 cc's of water. Okay. And then a cc of that in 99. Okay. And a cc of that in 99. Okay. And a cc of that in 99. You could end up with a, a dilution of uh, 1 to 2 million. Easy. Uh-huh. Okay? Right. And when when you give that the micro dilution back to the patient, when the patient walks into your office with the same symptoms that the crude stuff causes, the micro dilution will cure it. Wow. That is that's energy with that that's the energy that is that is taken from within the product by diluting it and diluting it and diluting it. Now that is a very difficult concept for people to grab a hold of. But imagine is this: if you take a, a block of wood and you cut it in half, instead of having four sides, you have eight sides. Then you take that and cut that in half. You now have sixteen sides, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then thirty-two and then 64, and then 128. And each time you expose the, the, the material to the atmosphere, we'll say, okay. you have elaborated energy. And it's the energy that, that is the thing that works to allow the body to defend itself against the initial problem. So that's what's, that's what's called... Micro dilution and in homeopathy, the the uh, the guiding words are like treats like. Okay. In other words, if I have say there was a, an, a a person came in to a doctor's office and the person had headaches, they would yeah. give them a homeopathic remedy, which in its crude state causes headaches, yeah. but in its micro diluted state the reverse happens. Wow. That's without using drugs. We don't use drugs. However, I'll say this to you. Mm-hmm. I'm not cast in stone. I, I, I can see other people's way of doing things. If an animal comes in and he's in an emergency and he just got slammed by a trailer truck yeah. and he's in deep shock, yeah. I'm going to give him intravenous steroids. Yeah. I'm going to give him a blood transfusion. I'm going to do all of that stuff, but, but I get him over the initial situation, I then give him homeopathic treatment. And the homeopathic treatment will depend upon who this dog is. Now, who is the dog? The dog is when I sit down with the owner, I say, by the way, does he have a temperature preference? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, he, he loves it when it's, when it's warm outside. He can't stand the cold or vice versa. Mm-hmm. You're right. He loves it when it's uh, cold outside. He can't stand the warmth. That is a modality. So that's one thing that sets this this dog aside from maybe the the next dog in the family. And then, uh, then one dog is so afraid of noise and thunder and lightning that he goes underneath the table. He's shivering and he's shaking. He's in the owner's lap. Yeah. And there's another animal in the house who could kill us. Yeah. Exactly. So here we have one animal is frightened of noise and frightened of 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 of, of, of firecrackers on July the fourth. They don't know what to do with them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That animal will often, often, as long as the rest of the picture fits, you see, mm-hmm. he will very often respond to homeopathic phosphorus. Okay. Very dramatically, and okay. we go and we go we can go on and on with. Uh, when we take a look at the fact that animals will come into the hospital or my office and he's got terrible oral health, his gums are bleeding and his mm-hmm. breath smells and this, that, and the other, and then we go ahead and we, he's an older animal, 
and we do some blood chemistries on him. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. find out that his kidneys aren't working yeah. properly. The, the mouth didn't happen by itself. It's secondary to the fact that the, the urinary, the renal system is ill. Yes. So when just instead of there, instead of giving him antibiotics after antibiotics to take care of the gums, yeah. you do something to take care of the, the, the renal the, system. The kidneys, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that fabulous? I love this. Yeah. I and love it. It's, it, it is just, well, I will have to tell you this. Okay. So that's homeopathy, we'll say. Okay. Yeah, that's in about a in a very small nutshell. Homeopathy is very intense, very very intense, and and no fooling around. You really get to know your patient well. Because my first visit with people is usually an hour to an hour and a half. Okay. Of questions, questions, okay. and then I have to take those questions and build a, uh, I build a profile of this particular patient. Okay. And that in that profile lies all kinds of signposts pointing to remedies which work would work if put to use and we do it nowadays nowadays we do it with computers uh-huh okay we do it with so- we do it with software oh i love that okay yep okay so now that's homeopathy will say now you talk about chiropractic chiropractic as far as i'm concerned is fantastic okay because you've got these uh, these uh, the way the nerves are in the body on the in the spinal cord Mm-hmm. The way they come out of the spinal cord and the way they innervate and they go to the, the different uh, limbs mm-hmm. and uh, organs on the inside. And most people are out of whack. Most people are, are not yeah. in, a, in good adjustment. No, how could we be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Life you know, live. and you uh-huh. can uh, get adjusted and you can be out of it in another month or weeks or whatever. Yeah. But by, uh, by aligning the body, by aligning and allowing those, uh, uh, the chemical, uh, the chemical flow, the electrical flow in the body to be uninterrupted. And I can tell you this because I've, I've had some wonderful things happen to me from chiropractic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so chiropractic and homeopathy go together very nicely. Okay. Now we come to acupuncture. Now acupuncture has been around for five thousand years. Yeah. And there are people who criticize it. I see it. I see. Uh, medical people saying, oh, it's a bunch of baloney. It is not. Mm-hmm. It's for real. These guys who who really know how to do acupuncture do a great service. When I was in practice in uh, Florida and my partner, Bob, was a, was a very, very good uh, acupuncturist, I've seen German shepherds walk into that office that mm-hmm. could barely drag their hind legs in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they were going to be put to sleep. Yeah. Didn't have any other so cases. my friend, my colleague, treated them. Maybe very, uh, usually it would see anywhere between six, seven, eight visits, and they would come walking in, just amazing. Wow! Just walking beautifully, and they were going to be killed. Yeah. They were advised to have their animals destroyed because yeah. of this paresis, they call it. This paresis. Right. The hind legs were almost paralyzed. Well, they didn't have any and I saw that happen time and time and time again. Yeah. And people and people have got the the gall to say that the that, that acupuncture doesn't work. Now, acupuncture is not just acupuncture. Mm-hmm. Acupuncture is also TCM. It's TCM. What does that mean? Traditional Chinese medicine. Yes. Which okay. consists of all these various herbs. You know, herbs like yun and pao that are used for bleeding. We'll okay. say. Okay. Uh, and, and on and on and on. Right. And then, and and there, the, uh, then what happens is the you know the body has meridians, meridians of energy, and acupuncture and acupuncture points. You know where they go in with a little needle. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely stimulate when they know what they do. It's a very very complicated thing, but they know what they're doing, and it works. Chiropr- uh, I will tell you that acupuncture in horses is great. You, you, so many horses are out of whack. They're lame. Yeah. They're not doing well. And a guy will come in and and do and adjust a 1,200-pound animal. Yeah. And they will have amazing results. Yeah. All of these things. You know, um, mm. there was a guy by the name of Paracelsus. Now, Paracelsus was a doctor who lived, uh, oh, I think he lived in uh, between... 
no, 14 and between the, the, the latter part of the 1400s and the, and the first part of the 1500s. Okay. He was a Swiss gentleman, Paracelsus. Okay. okay. He has a lot, his name you would, I can't remember, but he's got a name that would, he's got about 40 letters. <laughs> in it. But anyway, he was brilliant. And he said, he said, the creator of all things has put upon this earth everything that we need to heal and make ourselves well. He said, it's only up to science to figure out how to use it. Now, when he said that, what he was saying was, you don't have to have stuff coming out of a bottle. You don't have to have drugs, in other words. Mm-hmm. He's talking about the natural, the natural things that are out there in the, uh, out there in the, in the woods and in the ground, every place. And in my, in my front yard, I had, I had a bush, which uh, among the Indians, was called the Stopham Bush. Huh? Wonderful. How did they okay. figure that one out? The Stopham Bush, if you chewed on the leaves and you had diarrhea, you got better because in the leaves was paragoric. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh-huh. I had another bush in my, in my uh, yard that was called the toothache bush. The same thing. You chewed on it, the, the uh, irritation, the inflammation in your, in your jaw, your teeth went away. Wow. Of course, it's, and I've often, I often wondered how it is that these native civilizations discovered all of these wonderful things that, yeah. that, uh, that work yeah, and that, that aren't drugs yeah. and that are just things just growing there. But they did, and there are thousands of them. Yeah. And they're very, very effective. Yeah. So, once again, alternative medicine is so wonderful. Because it's, number one, it's inexpensive. Uh, not, that's probably not number one, but it's part of it. Mm-hmm. But it's also, uh, it, it, it's very, it's gentle as a rule. You know what you're doing. It's gentle. And I had a phone call from a woman today, just this day, and she called me from, uh, from Florida. Okay. About her, her cat who passed away during the night. Oh. 21 years old. And I'd been t- I'd been treating that cat for a while, mm-hmm. and she had no thought that the cat would ever survive, and the cat did, mm-hmm. and the cat became a happy pussy cat. Mm-hmm. He finally, but with homeopathic medicine, when you've been on it, and that's what you've been treated with, when you when the end comes, yeah. when your body can no longer sustain itself, right. the passing is very gentle and easy, without a lot of suffering. And she said, Dr. Young, she says, I can't not thank you enough for what you did for Zia. Because she died in the night. The last number of weeks have been very, very nice. She's been purring. She's been yeah. eating. Not the way she used to. Yeah. But she just had, she just went so gently. Wow. And she, she was thrilled. She didn't like her kitty cat dying. But as I pointed out to her, nobody lives forever. So at least if you have to go, go and go quietly, go gently. Yes. And that's what home, that's what homeopathy does. The wow. patients do not uh, necessarily suffer. So, Doctor so, Young, how do we find out more about this? What to find out what we need to know? Um, how do we find out more? Well, first of all, it depends upon. It's a very it's a very broad uh, subject, of course. Okay. Yes. However, uh, there are there are books all over the place. Okay. But my first uh, the first book that I uh, ever read on uh, homeopathy was uh, was a book that's out there called uh, Let's see. It's by it's a by by a guy by the name of Dana Ullman, U L M A N, and uh, it's basically uh, about just if you if you if you Google homeopathy and Dana Ullman, U L M A N, okay, you will come across his uh, his writing, his one book okay. that I okay. that I read in the very very beginning, okay, and there was one other guy, he's. Is tremendously ta- uh, uh, 
talented fellow by the name of George Fafulkas. V I T H O U L K A S. He's a Greek gentleman. Mm-hmm. George Fafulkas. And he has a book out. Uh, it's a, it's a basic book on homeopathy. And it's, uh, it's easy reading. Okay. In other words, you don't, you don't have to be a, a, a scientist to understand what they're, uh, what they're telling you. Well, and I, I would think if anybody, if anybody was interested, if they could get, they would either read some of the stuff by, mm-hmm. uh, by Dana Ullman mm-hmm. or George the Focus. Okay. It would give them an entry, an entree, I should say, okay. into, uh, the field of homeopathy. But another thing is this. You know what I've learned? I've learned the greatest thing that's ever happened is Googling. <laughs> you can Google, you can it's Google wonderful, anything. Isn't it? We love it Google. Is. Yeah. It absolutely is. So, yeah. uh, that, another, now, the other book, this book, The Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. I was going to say Dr. Pitcairn's book. Right, that's, Dr. Pitcairn. that's got a lot of great homeopathy in right. it, too, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, it uh, does. So, there's, there's plenty of stuff out there to, uh, okay. to, to, to make it available for you to, uh, to, okay. to read and study. Uh, and you don't have to, as I say, you don't have to be the greatest student in the world. Just, Okay. But once you're caught up in it, you're sunk because <laughs> that's what you want. You want you. You got to find more and more and more and more, yeah. don't you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, what you and I have touched upon today yeah. is actually minuscule to what we could keep keep talking about. People say to me, yes. "How long can you talk to us, Doctor?" And I say, three days." <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I we've covered that. some we've we've covered some interesting things today, have we not? We have co- covered wonderful things today, and you know, to me, I would like to go deep into every one of our topics. You know, um, so we've gone through so many things. I think we've given people, uh, our audience, um, information, really important information, and some direction and some hope. Uh, I know I have hope uh, for the animals that are suffering from chronic illness and disease. Now, so, so, yeah. Proper, right at the bottom of it all, though, is, is, is proper nutrition. Yeah. And then uh, there's also stress management. Yeah. A lot of animals that I have uh, been brought to me or I've talked to people on the phone about, I, even ha- I haven't even had to treat them. I just adjust their diet and adjust their, uh, their home life and uh, their... You know their, uh, their the, the foods, the supplements, the vitamins, the minerals, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I just adjust it, and then I wait, and very often they get better, mm. just because what people don't understand is the body can heal itself. Yeah. Just don't get in the way, doctor. Yeah. You know, you start oh. throwing all kinds of medicine at them. Every time you use a medicine. There's a possibility you're going to have a price to pay. Yes. Yeah. And there's a thing in in uh, Hahnemann's work. He has a thing way back that that 200 years ago. He had a some of his work said it was dealt with abuse. Because now I'm using a a, a a 19th century word, abuse of medicaments. Too much. Too powerful. Too strong. And not even indicated, but mm-hmm. that's what it was. And you have to be mm-hmm. very careful. More is not better in treatment. It just isn't. Yeah. So there you are. Okay. And uh, there was, like I say, there's, there, there are books out there that uh, Dr. Hahnemann wrote, but they're, you know, okay. they're kind of <laughs> difficult to understand. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But there you go. So okay. I, right. I can only say that anybody who's uh, a little bit interested mm-hmm. uh, in this sort of thing, uh, can, there, there's a world of stuff out there, uh, just a world, but and you, that one thing builds upon another. And we just need to know to ask the right questions, and there there is a world out there. Otherwise, we Absol- don't even know that, that there is something else that we can do. Uh, now, you mm-hmm. have an introduction to homeopathy for animals as a seminar. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I do that. I have a, okay. in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited by the, uh, mid, mid, uh, um, it was called the, uh, 
the it was the veterinary conference. Okay. Mid America Veterinary Conference given at the uh, at the Ohio State University, sponsored by the Ohio State Veterinary uh, uh, Board or, or uh, group, and I went there and, I, and for six uh, seven hours, I taught those people about homeopathy. Wow. Seven hours. Woo. Okay. But it was great, and uh, it okay. was just you know, and I uh, yeah, it was great. In fact, I uh, what happened was. My two grandsons, my twin grandsons, they are cyber geniuses. Okay. And I bought each one of them a ticket. I flew them down to Stewart, Florida, where I lived, and we did a PowerPoint uh, program okay. for that that program on veterinary on, on veterinary homeopathy. Okay. It was elegant. Okay. So no, I've got I've got. Uh, All right. I got a lot of stuff written and other uh-huh. things. I even got I've got CDs that I've had published and okay, all kinds of stuff. Great, I love that. Okay, so how people can find you is through your website. My website is homeopathyanimals.com. Okay, so homeopathy. Think the word homeopathyanimals.com. Okay, and of course, yeah, and that'll open up a lot of stuff. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and spell it just in case people miss that. It's www.homeopathyanimals.com. Give it. that woman a, uh, a free a free seat at all of the Phillies games. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Young. I'll go any place. If somebody wants to listen okay. to me, and they want to they want to hire me for a day I'll come okay no question about it well and I appreciate the work that you've done the your journey has been a remarkable one and I love the work that you're doing to help our animals and ourselves to heal and the planet to heal ah, so important thank you do you have a do you have a, some kind of a thing that you put out every month like a- I do a, a weekly newsletter um, I have an animal communication made easy course. I have tips. I have lots of different, also CDs and home study yeah. courses and classes. Uh, so I do a animal lot of- communication. I I use it all the time. Thank you. I'm sure that you do. You would have to, given the nature yeah. of the work. You're listening to energy. You're connecting and you're listening. Oh yeah. You know, you know. Every time somebody wants to put an animal to sleep. Yeah. I uh, I ask them. I said I want you to get in touch with this. This uh, Larry Wolf, okay, who was a well-known animal communicator, okay, and I said I want you to okay it with the animal before you do it. Yeah. And sometimes the the animal says, yeah, "I've had it, I want out," and sometimes yes. they say, "No, I'm not ready to go yet." Yeah, I don't want to go yet. I'm just feeling yeah. bad, or I, you yeah, know, I just right. need a little exactly. help or something. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the consult types of consultations I do. That can be one of the most critical ones because when people rush the decision, you know, they push it, they, they're they told that they have to put their animal down, they don't have any choice for whatever reason, you know, they're sick or something. But if the animal is not on board with that, then what I find is that people regret that and they feel guilt for a very, very long time. They feel yes, kind they of do. haunted. They feel haunted by it. Yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. yeah, so it, it's a very critical decision to make, and not one to make lightly without your animal's input, because it is, in fact, their life. Yep. Right. Can I, uh, you guys, can I read you something? Yes, please. Would you mind? Okay. I want to read to you this poem that I wrote in March the 19th, 1993. Okay. It was in memory of Ginger. Okay. And it's called Love from My Dog. <clears throat> and it goes like this. I hope I can get through it. Most of the time I choke up. Okay. There, there's a need in all of us, I guess, to share a life with someone who always says yes. Never know. Certainly not maybe. Now that's where my dog comes in, loving me for me, adoration personified. I'll go where you go, you know. Just try me. How about a ride to the store or even the shore? A walk to the sea, just you and me, master of mine. It's okay with this best friend to be with you whatever the end, to watch and wait near our garden gate, to hear your hoot, to scent your boot with tumultuous joy. Matters not to me your struggle within, 
For I'll sample your face with languorous tongue, and I'll snuggle at night, and I'll win your side of the bed. My life with you, from puppy romp to gray and slow, will forever be the best. We'll do it all, from bone to ball, from sunrise east to moonset west. You know, dear friend, my life, my own, there will come a day when I shall feel goodbye. Don't sigh, and our memories shall endure. God, what a time we will have had, each day, each night, on evening clear or morning fog. That special, special love we knew between you and me, your dog. Oh. Is that gorgeous? Oh, well, I've got tears in my eyes. Oof. Yeah. Thank we, you. Had a, we had a dog, this dog named Ginger, was yeah, put this down one afternoon. Oh. And the owner came back to the office that night out in the parking lot riding his bicycle, mm-hmm. crying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wrote that for him. Yeah. Ah, oh, boy, our animals get so close to our hearts, and they're so near and dear to yeah, us. They do, they yeah. do, they do, yeah. they do. Do you know that the first lecture that I ever gave in the field of homeopathy was in San Antonio? Really? It was a it was a, a lecture on homeopathy in exotic animals. Oh yeah, snakes, I to do iguanas, that. birds. That was my first thing. Uh, and now, is yep. it different with exotic animals than with, like, cats, dogs, or horses, or people? They is do better. Principle? They do better. They're very sensitive, yeah. yeah, they're very sensitive to homeopathic medicine beautifully. Okay. Because they've never been vaccinated. Okay. They've never been loaded up on antibiotics and steroids. Right. And as a result, we, got a, we have a pure body to wow. work with. Wow. Okay. That yeah, makes no, a lot of sense. Uh, uh, nothing, there's nothing like a snake, I always say. You put them in... <laughs> You put him in a room, and you go back a month later, he's the same as he was <laughs> when he first put him in there. He hasn't moved a muscle. <laughs> it's what is known as apathy. <laughs> the masters of apathy. Yeah, oh, oh, God, yeah. That's yeah. so funny. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. All right, well, we need to, let's close it off here. Um, yeah, thank you, absolutely. thank you, thank you so yeah. much. What is, what is your, what, what, do you have a mailing address or something? Yes, um, I will give that to you. How about I email it? Yeah, that's cool. Okay, yes, thank Very you good. so much. Can't, okay. uh, I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to share with you. I mean, it was a gift you gave me. Thank you. And uh, I won't forget it. Thank you, and thank you, too, for your love of animals and for your remarkable journey and okay. how much you've helped so many. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, life is like a uh, a pebble in a pond. You throw in a pebble and the ripples go all the way to the other side. Yes, yes. Yep. Oh, thank you so much. Yep. All right. Take care. All yep. right. Thank you. I'll Bye. talk to you Bye. later. Bye. Yes, ma'am.